This video is part of a series on the XV6 operating system kernel. In this video, I'll describe how the fork system call works. Whenever a process wants to create another process, it uses the fork system call. And this is the only way that processes are created, with the exception of the creation of the initial process. The process that does the creating is said to be the parent process, and it creates a child process. The child process is a clone of the parent process and almost exactly identical to the parent process. Uh, when the parent makes the fork system call, the kernel becomes active, and then at uh, some point the fork system call returns, and when it returns, both processes now exist. And so in both processes, there will be a return from the system call. One major difference is that the fork system call returns the child's process ID, while the fork system call returns zero in the child process. The code in the pro both processes, the parent and the child, will typically take a look at the return value, and that code can then determine whether it is running in the child or the parent process, and can then take uh, actions uh, differently depending on whether it uh, needs to, be to behave as a child or a parent. If there is any difficulty, uh, such as we run out of memory and we can't allocate the pages for the child, the fork system call will return minus one in the parent. So what's involved in creating the child process? Well, we do several things and then we return the process ID of the child. The first thing we do is call the alloc proc function. This will search for an unused proc structure and grab it and begin the initialization process. It starts by assigning a new process ID to that proc structure. It also creates an empty address space and adds mappings for the trampoline and trap frame pages. Then, after alloc proc uh, returns, we need to copy the virtual address space. So every data page from the parent process is copied and added to the child's virtual address space. The permissions on each data page in the child will be set to be exactly the same as the permissions on the corresponding page in the parent's virtual address space. And then we initialize and set a few of the fields in the PROC structure. The size field is the number of bytes in the virtual address space. That is, since the virtual address space starts at zero, that's just the same as the break address at the top of the heap. So that's copied. Next, we copy the trap frame. When the system call was made in the parent process, all the registers of the user process were saved, as well as the program counter. And those were saved in the trap frame. And by copying the trap frame, it means that the child process, when it's scheduled again and runs in user mode, will have exactly the same values in all of its registers, and it will begin executing at the same spot, namely directly after the e-call instruction that did the fork system call. And then we modify register A0 to set it to zero so that uh, the child process will uh, see a return value of zero. Each process has a name, and we copy uh, the name field, so the child process will be uh, given the same name as the parent process. Each process has a number of open files. We copy all of the file descriptors for open files in the parent process into the child process, so that any file that was open in the parent process will then be open in the child process. We also copy the current working directory, so the child will be in the same working directory. And we then set the parent pointer in the, chi in the child's proc structure to point to the parent's proc structure. This is the other difference between the child process and the parent process. They each have a different location in the parent-child hierarchy of processes. And finally, we set the state to runnable. And at that point, we're done 
creating the trial process. It's runnable and it will be scheduled when it's given a chance. So at this point, uh, the system call is able to just simply return the process ID of the child that has been created. Next, let's look at uh, that in code. So here is the fork process in the file proc.c. The system call initially invoke, invokes sysfork. Sysfork simply calls fork, and whatever fork returns, sysfork will return. So we begin by getting a pointer to the parent's uh, proc structure, and then we call the alloc proc function. If there are any problems, then we return minus one and we're done. But otherwise, we save a pointer. Uh, NP is a new process, I guess. So we have a pointer to that process. Alloc proc will also acquire the lock on the newly created proc structure. And it will initialize the virtual address space. And in this step, we invoke UVM copy to copy all of the data pages from the parent into the child's virtual address space. So these are pointers to the page tables, and that's uh, the size of the address space, which uh, indicates the number of pages that need to be copied. If there are any problems, then we free this proc structure. This zeroes out all the fields and returns everything to the free memory pool. And then we release the lock on that structure and return minus one. But assuming everything's good, we keep going. Uh, here we make a copy of the size field. And here we copy the trap frame. So this is where we are copying all of the registers that were valid in user mode, as well as the program counter from the parent to the child. So the child can resume executing at exactly the same place. And here we modify A0 to clear it to zero so that uh, the return value will be zero. In this uh, code here, we are running through the open files of the parent, and for each file that is open, we make a duplicate of that and add it to the child here. And here we're uh, making a duplicate of the current working directory and copying that, so the child will have the same current working directory. Here we are copying the parent's name into the name field of the child, and here we grab the process ID of the child, and we're going to be returning it right down here. Uh, then we see that we are updating the parent pointer uh, of the child to point to the parent's proc structure. Whenever the parent pointer is accessed, either read or modified, we must be holding a lock called wait lock. So we acquire that lock here and then re release it here. And finally, we set the state of this uh, process to runnable and release the lock that was acquired up in alloc proc and then return. At that point, um, the uh, child process has been created and will get scheduled whenever uh, the scheduler gets around to it. We also see something else going on here. We see uh, during this uh, code right here, we first release the lock on the child and then reacquire it. And um, we also notice that um, we don't just return the PID field here, we copy it to a variable and then return that. This is because we need to acquire this field while we are holding a lock on the process. It's possible that you know, the minute we release that lock, this proc structure will get scheduled, it will run, it will exit, and uh, another a uh, fork call will grab this process and a new PID will be assigned. Highly unlikely that all this sequence of events could occur, but in an operating system, we have to assume that anything that can occur will occur. And so if we just simply grab the PID field from the proc structure after releasing the lock, we could, in fact, get uh, the wrong number. So that's why we grab the process ID while we're still holding the lock. But still, we haven't re uh, figured out why we are releasing this lock and then reacquiring it. So for that, I want to uh, go back and remind you about deadlock. So here's a simple deadlock situation. We have two processes, and we have two locks. 
and I'm going to show that uh, lock A is currently held by process 1 with a solid arrow. And I'm going to show that lock B is currently held by process 2 with a solid arrow. Now, let's assume that uh, process 1 wants to acquire lock B. That is, it has called the acquire function and it's trying to obtain a lock on the uh, lock B, which is impossible because it's uh, held by process 2. Uh, so the acquire function will be spinning here. Meanwhile, process 2 is wanting lock A, so it calls acquire, and it is spinning, tied up in the acquire function, waiting on lock A. This is a deadlock. Deadlock in general occurs whenever we have a cycle in one of these graphs that involves processes and locks. Here I'm showing a very simple cycle, but we can have more complex cycles. But this gives the idea of what deadlock is. There's a cyclic wait situation. Process 1 can't proceed because it can't get lock B. Process 2 can't proceed because it can't get lock A. And so they're both frozen. Now, in our situation, uh, we I haven't yet talked about the code in exit and wake up, but we do have this situation. The wait lock is concerned whenever um, we are basically looking at the parent-child hierarchy. And when a process exits, we need to notify uh, its parent. So the wait lock will be acquired in the exit um, function, and we also have a function wake up. And wake up goes through all of the potential parent processes. It goes through all processes, in fact, and grabs all of the locks on those processes. So um, we have this situation where uh, at, any, at some point in this, these two functions, we might have a situation where the wait lock is held and we are trying to acquire the lock on a particular process. Now in fork, we are um, needing to grab the wait lock to modify the parent, uh, uh, the parent field. So we see that uh, right here. We are calling acquire to grab the wait lock. Okay. Now what if we were holding a lock on some process? Okay. Then we would have the arrow going here, and uh, that would be our deadlock situation, and we can't allow that. So this is um, an explanation for why we must release the lock on the process before we attempt to acquire the lock called wait lock. Next, let's take a look at what happens in the child process. At some point, the scheduler will select the child process and will invoke switch. Switch will load the registers from context. These are the registers that were saved previously in most cases, but in this case, they have been just initialized. And then switch will do a return. Well, register RA was loaded from context, and this return will effectively just jump to the instruction that's pointed to by RA. When the fork system call created the child, it called alloc proc, and among other things, that function initialized the context for this process. It zeroed out all the registers, and it saved in RA the address of this function called forkret, and it saved in the SP register the stack pointer. Uh, that is, in fact, uh, the page that's pointed to by the kstack field in the proc structure. And since stacks grow downward, we save the uh, pointer to the top of that page. So we have a fresh stack and a starting address in this function called forkret, which we'll look at in just a second. But before that, let's uh, review what happens in a, in a trap. So remember this picture. We're showing a trap, and we save the registers in user vec. User trap figures out what's going on. Let's say it's a timer interrupt, and we call yield, because I want to look at yield a little bit more. And yield does some stuff, um, as we saw it called switch eventually. But ultimately, uh, yield returns, and we come back, uh, and then user trap ret is invoked, uh, user ret is invoked, and these restore the registers and set things back up, and then return to the user mode with the sret instruction. So let's look at this pathway in a different way. Let's assume we've got a timer interrupt. So we've got a trap that uh, goes into user vec and user trap, that saves the user mode registers, and then calls the yield function. 
Well, what does yield do? Uh, yield basically just calls SCED after acquiring a lock on the process. Here, here is the code for yield to review it. So you see yield, it acquires the lock. Well, in the case of yield, uh, um, it uh, changes the state to runnable. Uh, in the case of a child process, it's already runnable, so uh, keep that in mind. But then it calls SCED, and then after SCED comes back, it releases the lock and then returns. So uh, we call SCED here, and what does SCED do? Well, SCED does some error checking. Uh, here's the SCED function. It does some error checking primarily, and uh, essentially just calls switch and then returns. And so uh, when switch returns, uh, we are back in SCED. SCED returns, and then uh, yield uh, becomes active, uh, does its last statement, which is to unlock the process. And then it returns to user trap ret, which immediately calls user trap ret, and then that calls user ret, and then that calls, uh, that uh, executes the sret instruction, which pushes back in user mode. Switch does uh, some things. Basically, it, it unlocks the process and goes off and invokes a scheduler and may execute some other processes, but eventually it reacquires the lock. And at that point, switch will load all the registers and return to RA. Okay, and normally that would be a return address in the SCED function. But in the case of uh, a child process, um, we've preloaded RA with forkret. So when switch uh, returns, it will be returning not to some address in SCED where it can finish this process here, but it will be essentially jumping to forkret. Well, what does forkret do? It unlocks the lock on the process and calls user trap ret. So essentially it, it does this right here. It uh, takes us uh, into this point so we can complete the return process. Uh, user trap ret will load the user registers. Uh, uh, remember we've saved a copy of the parent's user registers. Uh, we've also modified A0 to B0, uh, but this is how the user registers were saved and they will be loaded by user trap ret and it will call user ret and um, ultimately the sret instruction will happen and we will resume execution after the call to fork or more precisely after the e call instruction so just to complete this let's take a, a look at forkret's code here is the fork code for forkret and you can see it does exactly the, what we said um, it is uh, going to um, release the lock on the process and invoke user trap ret. Um, this code here is only executed the first time for the first time slice, and that would be for the init process when uh, it gets going. And this just does a little initialization. It'll set first to zero, and from then on, this code will never get executed. So we can ignore that. It won't be uh, involved for any child process. Okay, uh, that's how the fork system call works. I'll see you in the next video.